Saul is very brave to um, invite me back. I was actually at the first uh, BIF, and when I finished my remarks, um, Richard Saul Werman was the moderator then, and he said to me and everybody else, he said, well, the second part of that started to get better. <laughs> so, you know, okay, so two proof points that I have not improved since then. One, uh, I brought notes uh, because that, that, you know, that day, again, eight years ago, still burned in my mind. And second, I forgot to wear a belt. So you see, I have the handheld because I have no belt. So I'm a complete failure as a storyteller. So you'll just have to bear with me. Um, I, I want to talk today about cities, which, uh, you know, I, I think I've been in love with cities uh, since forever. I grew up in this uh, small, uh, small house in uh, South Memphis, and that was uh, back in the days when we could walk around the corner to the neighborhood commercial district and find a library, a movie theater, a grocery store, a cleaners, uh, the school was within walking distance, so was the fire department. Um, the wrestlers lived in the um, apartment complex across the way and we were all sort of there together. And, um, and, and so, so again, cities have always fascinated me and, and my, so this continuing quest for me has been what makes cities successful. And um, I've done a lot of work around that question, a lot of study, a lot of reading, a lot of talking, a lot of interviewing, uh, 900 plus interviews for Smart City. And you know, I think that's a question I can actually now answer. Um, and, and the answer explodes a myth that I think stands in the way of really understanding cities uh, and their success at, uh, at their essence. And that's because I think most, uh, most of us and most economic development officials and mayors, uh, Saul's in a different category, but believe that the way jobs uh, get created uh, in, a, in a place is that you sort of send the economic development team out and uh, they bag the buffalo and they drag it home to provide lots of red meat uh, for job seekers. <laughs> and, and that's, you know, that, and that's the premise, that's the belief on which most economic development occurs. But that's not at all the case. Uh, actually, jobs come from the people who live in a community, and they come from the distinctiveness that uh, is embedded in those people in the community, both the producers and the consumers. So who is in a community really matters, uh, and it really matters to the success of a city. Well, it turns out that 58% of any city's success can be explained by the percentage of college graduates in its population, and I know a number of you here um, at BIF are engaged in that work. Thanks very much for the work you do. It, it, you know, there, there's a meme going around today that I think is actually very dangerous. Uh, and that is that, uh, oh, you know, college degrees don't matter anymore because we all know people with a college degree, maybe even an advanced degree, who are unemployed or, under, or are underemployed. Don't let that distract you from um, the truth. And the truth is that if you have a college degree, you are far more likely to be employed today, even in this economy, you're far more likely to make more money. And counterintuitively, I suppose, the people uh, who with, with uh, less education are actually more likely to be employed and more likely to make more money if they live in communities with, with a higher percentage of people with a college degree. So, so, with, so talent's important. And if talent's important, then, uh, then a city has to ask, how do we get more of it, right? That's what, that's what you want. We want more talent. Um, so there are three ways you can get more talent. You can develop it, you can attract it, and you can retain it. Ideally, you do all three. That's the way you um, build a more uh, successful community. Again, defining success as per capita income. Uh, 
you know, we talk a lot uh, in America about the development of talent. We haven't crack the code necessarily of how to do it really well and that's what all the conversation is about. But, you know, it's certainly been the topic of discussion in Chicago the last couple of weeks with the teacher strike. I mean, we, we read about education, we read about skills development, job training, all of these are urgent. We make feature films about charter schools. Um, we, uh, you know, the high cost of college is on the front of news magazines. So there's, there's, there's no shortage of talk about the need to develop talent in America, thank goodness, because it is critically important. There's also a reasonable amount of attention on talent attraction. A few years ago uh, at CEOs for Cities, we, uh, we're, we worked with Yankelovich to do a study of recent college graduates um, nationwide, and we were trying to understand how they made their decisions about where they would live. And it turned out that 64% of them said, first, they choose the city they want to live in, then they look for a job. Um, and for the past decade, I guess, Chamber of Commerce types and even mayors have um, have developed strategies for talent attraction. They're not all very smart. In fact, I would say most of them are not terribly smart. But they do understand that talent attraction is part of, um, is part of their job uh, in those leadership positions and if they want to build their economy. But the problem is talent is mobile. It's very mobile. And the more, uh, the more education you have, the more mobile you are. So it, it's not enough simply to develop talent. It's not enough simply to attract talent. You also have to keep talent. But where is the substantive and equivalent debate about how to keep talent in communities? And what do we really know about the strategies that work? You know, our, our, I worry a lot about mid-sized cities. And I wonder if mid-sized cities are really consigned to fight a losing battle for talent against more glamorous cities like New York and San Francisco, maybe Chicago, Seattle. Should uh, America let cities like Buffalo and Detroit and my hometown of Memphis pick up the tab for educating children, but then just happily wave goodbye as they go off to cities with more opportunity and more amenities, as economist Ed Glazer uh, once uh, suggested to Buffalo. You know, I think it's like any business. It's easier to keep the customers you have than to go out and get new ones. So this question of what sticks talent to community, I think, is really important. Um, but the answer to that question is not so clear, but I think we do have some clues. Uh, Knight Foundation has conducted over the last uh, several years, three years actually, uh, a survey called the Soul of the Community. They did it in conjunction with the Gallup organization, and they were asking this question of what sticks people to community. And they found the top three factors uh, were these, social offerings, openness, and aesthetics. Um, which, those are the top three attributes which I think are somewhat surprising. But even when you know that, you have to ask the question, what, what do we need to do to deliver on those essentials, particularly in a world where people sometimes seem so alienated from civic life and from public place and from the local community around them. You know, I'm always struck by um, talk fest like this one, where all the people seem to want to do good halfway around the world. Um, now, you know what? There have been some great exceptions at this meeting. Hillary and Tina and lo lo lots of people uh, here who've been talking about the work they're doing in this community and in communities like it. And I, I love that. Uh, I love hearing that. But, you know, I just think it's a lot sexier uh, to say you're figuring out a solution for some problem in India than in your own backyard. And so how do you attach people to community when, 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 that's, 
when that's the case, when sexy is a half a world away. And also, I think when, how do you do that when communities have become in a lot of ways so generic and interchangeable? There was a story, I don't know, you may have read it in the New York Times earlier uh, this week about the Americanization of the, uh, the Champs-Élysées. It was not flattering. Um, as one Parisian described the famous street in this article, it feels more like nowhere because we find the same things as everywhere. Now, if that's what America becomes, a thousand places that feel like nowhere, that elicit no passion, no pride from their citizens, then I think we're in deep trouble. Um, some of you also may have read the story several months ago in the Atlantic Magazine, uh, was called Rise of the Global Elite. And in it, uh, Christia Freeman wrote, wrote this, the rich of today are different from the rich of yesterday. Our light speed, globally connected economy has led to the rise of a new super elite who feel they are deserving winners of a tough worldwide economic competition. And many of them, as a result, have an ambivalent attitude toward those of us who didn't succeed so spectacularly. Now, I couldn't resist including that this week. Okay. Uh, but she went on to write, perhaps most noteworthy, they are becoming a trans-global community of peers who have more in common with one another than with their countrymen back home. No matter where they have houses, and they likely have uh, multiple houses, they are increasingly a nation unto, in the, unto themselves, less connected to the nations that granted them opportunity and the countrymen they are leaving ever further behind. Now, you may dismiss this as insignificant. I mean, after all, how many people qualify uh, to be among the global elite? But have you noticed how many people own second and third homes? And they, they get on a plane and they effortlessly move uh, between those homes regularly. Well, they're not the global elite. Those are the people who used to provide the civic leadership. They used to sit on the art museum board. They used to lead the United Way campaign. And when you divide your time among multiple houses, where do you call home? I believe, uh, this is a question that I've been thinking about for a number of years, and I don't have answers. Again, I think I have some clues. And um, let me just share what I think are three factors that really are maybe significant in why I call a place home, or what leads me to call a place home. Three factors, connections, distinctiveness, and agency. I want to just talk about those really briefly. Connections are, you know, I think in many ways the essence of home. Where's family? Where are friends? Where are the colleagues? Uh, where are my collaborators? Where are the people with whom I share uh, values? I think in a lot of ways, if you look at that top attribute, Knight uh, said social offerings, the product of social offerings is connections. But increasingly, the people we want to connect with are spread out, right, because of technology and because of our mobility. So the influence that connections have on um, where one calls home, I think, are growing more tenuous. Distinctiveness is terribly underrated when it comes to cities. The drive to copy best practices, a lack of civic imagination, and the fear of failure, I think, all work to um, mitigate uh, against uh, distinctiveness. And I think so does the overuse of consultants. I have a good colleague, Joe Courtright, who warned a group of urban leaders I was with, every consultant in the world can answer some questions. What is distinctive about your community is not one of them. <laughs> distinctiveness is the opposite of that commodified Champs-Élysées that was described by the Times. And if we're not careful, that's where we're headed. And no one wants to call a place home that feels more like nowhere for long. And finally, there's agency. Karn uh, opened this convening talking about agency as a global, uh, in a global sense. And agency means that I have the ability to influence 
what happens in my city. I have the ability to influence its future. Now, agency can cut both ways. Karn didn't talk about that. I think a lot of times we've all been in that situation where it's, you know, not in my backyard writ large. That's also uh, agency. Uh, not so good, but in a growing number of cities, people really are finding positive and even profound ways to uh, exert agency. I think if you just look at what's happened in the um, biking and the local food movements, uh, they both started with citizens, they were powered by citizens, and they had lots of on-ramps for citizens to participate. In a very short time, those two issues have gone from fringe, very fringe, to mass consciousness in a, again, in a really short uh, uh, length of time. And when citizens feel they can influence a place and the, feel like they can influence the future of a place, they feel that the future of a place can be better. I was uh, waiting recently uh, to be introduced with uh, Mayor Cory Booker, uh, Newark Mayor Cory Booker. We were on the same program and these introductions were going on forever. And so I couldn't resist putting on my radio hat and I slipped him a note and I said, what remains your biggest challenge as mayor? And he looked at it and he laughed and then he, big sigh, and he leaned over to me and he said, getting people to believe that things can be different. And I've thought a lot about, I've thought a lot about that since he said it to me. And you know, if personal agency is welcomed and made easy, not only will people believe they can, um, that things can be better, I think they will make them better. And, and when I say, when I talk about personal agency, I am not talking, Bridget, about ignoring government or, or shunting government aside. I mean, government is nothing but an expression of us. Government is, is, is doing together what we cannot do alone. And so I think, again, local government has a real uh, opportunity and uh, moment to step up to this challenge. I think this is going to be the new model for attaching people to place, making the city an inviting platform for people to apply their ideas, their creativity, and their collective will, and do it much cheaper and quicker than it can be done top down. I think that's the real future of smart cities, and it's the way to make a city home. Thanks.